All right, how you doing? I'm Darren with Three Rivers Fishing Adventures, and today I just wanted to do a, kind of a complete guide to sturgeon fishing on the Rainy River. Uh, I don't guide on the Rainy River, but uh, some, of, some of the people I run into down here um, are really interested in going up and fishing sturgeon on the uh, Rainy River, and I'm asked about it quite often, so I kind of wanted to put something together so I can reference them too. I don't have to keep going over it over and over again. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna get, kind of go through the basics um, of what we do on our trip, you know, the, what we use, uh, some locations, uh, just a general synopsis. Uh, if you want to do a self-guided trip to go up there and uh, catch these fish in the spring. The spring and fall are usually the two seasons that are really good, um, but uh, the spring seems to be the popular one, especially um, with the other seasons kind of closed during that time. It's kind of a popular time for people to uh, get up there and, and fish for them. So. So the Rainy River runs along the border of Minnesota and Canada. It runs east to west from Rainy Lake to Lake of the Woods and it's about 85 miles long. So I'll switch over to this map here and we'll kind of start off Minneapolis-St. Paul area and it's along the border here. So we'll just kind of zoom up. And it starts over here in Rainy Lake and runs over to Lake of the Woods here. So the two kind of major cities are International Falls over here and uh, Baudette on the west side. So kind of the most popular area that people target is this Baudette area. So we actually have the city of Baudette over here. They have a couple hotels you can stay at there. Otherwise, um, if you come out here to uh, Wheeler's Point, this is Wheeler's Point right here. All along here, there's dozens of resorts Lots of places to stay. They all have uh, lots of cabins, um, restaurants, bars, grills, etc. I I can't really. I've stayed at several. I can't really say one's better than the other. They're all fairly similar. You know, just a uh, main location with a bunch of ca bunch of nice cabins. So uh, I can't really recommend one over the other. Um, I can't even recommend one not to stay at because I've had a pretty good experience at most of them. So. Um, all along here, this is all resorts. And even down along here, there's a couple uh, resorts as well. So uh, plenty of opportunity. Just pull up that area on Google Map and uh, it'll list all the resorts up there. Um, so I'll go over the, uh, the main launch here. I can find it. Okay, there it is. So it's right next to Borderview Lodge. Is right, uh, right next to the ramp here. And this is kind of the main public ramp that everyone uses on that stretch of the river. It's right off 172, kind of right before you get out, out to the point here. Um, it does show a launch here next to Wigwam Resort. That one's not used very often because it's uh, really shallow in here. So this is the main launch you want to use. Um, and there's times when it's pretty busy. I've actually seen cars parked along the shoulder here, you know, all the way past this uh, bait shop which by the way, this is a little bait shop right here. Um, you can get all the bait you need right there. You don't even have to leave the point. So um, that's kind of that location. A lot of people fish this stretch of the river and then out into the uh, Four Mile Bay here. And what I need to caution you of is when you come out into here, you don't wanna go out into this area. It's really shallow you know, three to four feet. I guess if you have a, a jet boat or a real shallow John boat, you might be able to sneak through there. Uh, but I just wouldn't recommend going in there at all. You save a little bit of time that you can come out, you know, diagonal out to here. Um, but just stay out to the outside here. By the way, this is a Navionics web app. You can pull this up on your browser. Anyone can pull it up. You don't need a subscription or anything. And it's a, it's a pretty nice tool to use to find. You can see it has all the, uh, the contours of the river channel here, both US and Canada. So. Speaking of Canada, that's this red line right here. So you want to stay on the south side of that line, or in this case, it would be the uh, west side. You cannot fish for sturgeon in Canada. There is no season. So no matter what kind of rules or laws saying that you can be over on that side this time of the year, you, you, you just simply can't fish for sturgeon there. So um, just make sure you stay either on the, uh, the south side, or like I said, on this case, the west side of the red line, and you should be fine. A lot of times the, uh, the Border Patrol 
will come through there and they'll shoo you out if you're on the wrong side of the line. Uh, there's times though when they're not patient with that and if you're breaking some of their Canadian laws, they will not have patience for that and they'll write you up for uh, having alcohol in the boat, having live bait in the boat, uh, or fishing for sturgeon which is out of season. So uh, just steer clear of that line and you'll be safe. Um, I wanted to show you a lot of people fish this this area as it come out, comes out into the bay here. This, you want to fish this channel as it comes out into the bay because it's, like I say, it's showing, you know, shallow outside of the, the channel here. Um, a lot of people fish this deep hole as it turns the corner here, 45 feet. A lot of people gather in that hole. But you can catch fish all the way out here. And in fact, we've caught fish as it tails out here in 10 feet of water. Um, those fish are coming out of the main lake out here and coming in, you know, following that river channel. Um, so you can catch them, you know, as they take that path. They basically take this path from the main lake through here and then follow the river channel up into the river. This area out here, as it goes out in the main lake, is called the Gap or Lighthouse Gap, I believe they call it. Um, it's also another popular place. There's lot, and you can see it gets deep as that current cuts through there. It's basically cutting a channel. So um, that's another popular spot because it's kind of funneling. It's funneling all these fish from the main lake into this gap area. And uh, what you need to be careful of here is you can see this red line. Again, that's the border. Everything on this right side over here is Canada. The left side is US. So while this here looks like it would be tempting to fish on, and I know there's fish there, uh, that's Canada, so you don't want to fish there. And we made that mistake last year, actually. We were fishing in Canada, and we didn't even know it. And uh, we could have uh, we could have gotten in trouble for. We were out here fishing, you know, right off of this break right here. So uh, again, this is all Canada. So what you want to do if you come out here, you want to get west of this line, and you can fish, you know, anywhere out into it where it uh, tails out here. So. Um, a lot of times early in the spring, there's ice pack there, and you can't get out there anyways when we're talking, you know, these early times. So um, you might be limited by the ice. In fact, you might not even be able to fish this whole bay sometimes. Some years, that was all frozen over. We weren't able to get out there. So um, that's that area. So what I want to go over next is uh, we'll kind of come up into the river here, and I want to go over some of the other launches because you can catch fish all through the river. The whole stretch of the river, you can catch fish all the way to International Falls. So I just want to show some other popular launches that people use. And you'll see some of these are showing a launch, like it's showing a launch right here. That's actually part of a uh, resort or marina. And uh, I don't know if there's actually a launch you can use there or not. Um, so that's a little deceiving. I'm just kind of going to go over the, uh, the public launches that a lot of people use. So from Wheeler's Point, to the city of Baudette, it's roughly 12 miles. And uh, there's a launch just east of the city. It's in a little park here. I don't remember the name of the park. This is saying a River Park Street. Um, there's a launch right here, and that's a public launch that a lot of people use. Um, I've seen a lot of nice fish. People come up and fish the bridge up here, right behind that bridge, and catch a lot of nice fish. Um, it's a good place to launch if you're staying at one of the resorts or uh, Hotels in town, you don't have to go far. There's a launch right here. So that's another popular launch. We'll back out here and we'll head to the next one. So the next one's probably another 10 miles or so. Um, and it's just east of the Rapid River. This is the Rapid River right here, I believe. And here's the launch right here, right on town, town Line Road. A launch right here. So here's the main road here, Highway 11. And this is called Vita's Launch, Vita's Launch. I'm not sure exactly how you, you pronounce it, V-I-D-A-S. We just call it Vita's. It might be pronounced Vita's. Like I said, I'm not sure. But uh, there's a lot of parking here. It's a, it's a decent launch. We use this one quite a bit. And this one also gets busy. I've seen cars parked, you know, trucks and trailers almost all the way out to the main road, which is... Uh, like half a mile, maybe even closer to a mile. But yeah, uh, that's another good launch. Let's uh, 
Let's go further upstream here to the next one, which I believe, going kind of fast here, I might pass one. So this is Frontier right here, another one right off highway. These are all off Highway 11. Um, Frontier is another popular one. You can see there's ample parking there as well. Um, none of these launches are really better than the other, just gives you more options. Um, I've caught fish all along the whole river, so there's no, uh, like I said, there's no launch better than the other. Some of them you might be able to get away from people a little bit if you, if you don't like the crowds, which is nice. Uh, let's just keep moving upstream here. We'll go to the next one. Which is Birchdale. This one's Birchdale. So if you hear, I'm basically, I don't know if these are the official names of the launches, but this is what you'll hear, hear people say or talk about. On the, there's parking here. Um, I'll go to the next one. I'm not going to do the whole river. I'm just going to kind of go a little ways. Here you can see there's the, uh, I believe this is the Manitow Rapids here, which is another popular spot, kind of a lot of current and rock, rocky area, and there's kind of a pool down below, so a lot of people fish that area as well. Um, I don't think I missed any launches here. Kind of going fast through here. I believe there's a launch on this stretch down here somewhere. Maybe not. At any rate, I'm kind of, oh, there's a, there's one in Loman here, I believe, if I, if I remember right. What I wanted to show you here was these main tributaries, which is the Little Fork and Big Fork rivers. And uh, I believe they do have some boat launches off of these tributaries, but these are kind of key for the springtime movement of the river. All the, what people say when they blow out, uh, basically the ice, ice thaws, the current moves in and it turns basically the river into a chocolate milk mess and it just fishing kind of slows down quite a bit when that happens the river rises the current picks up you have a lot of uh, a lot of grass and debris in the river makes it kind of tough um, especially for the walleye guys if you're up there walleye fishing that pretty much shuts the river down for a week or two so when people say the forks blowing out that's what they're referring to is these um, tributaries so again if you if you plan on doing this trip make sure you uh, you stay current with uh, what's happening up there and you can follow some of the resorts their their pages on facebook or some of the groups one of the groups i recommend is the minnesota sturgeon fishing facebook group about three thousand people on there there's several members from up that area who are kind enough to share current conditions what's happening with the river so uh, that makes it really nice you can kind of keep up and uh, plan your trip accordingly it's the weather the current conditions uh, the wind, there's so much factors play into it that it's really nice if you can to time your trip, you know, within three or four days. If you can do that, that's ideal. You can see the condition, you can say, okay, heading up there versus picking a date and just uh, rolling the dice because we have rolled the dice and we, we've we wound up with having some pretty interesting trips where you have, you know, snowstorms, you know, with eight inches of snow. Uh, we One year we had those forks blow out and it was completely flooded. We had 12 ounces of weight and, you know, we've seen like picnic tables floating by and it was just impossible to catch fish. We caught a few, but it's, it's just kind of a wasted trip at that point. So, um, like I said, that, that's going to dictate usually the, uh, the success you have fishing. So, uh, so another thing I want to talk about is the, the seasons, which is kind of confusing. A lot of people have questions about the seasons. So there is sort of a continuous season for catch and release, and then they also have a, a harvest season as well. So the, the, as I show you the, uh, the regulations here, keep in mind that the continuous season is from the past season. So, you know, it started, you know, last June or whatever, and goes continuously throughout the winter. Um, as a catch and release season. So um, that won't show here on the screen, but just know that the season's open right now. Today's March 13th. It's open right, right now and uh, it's continuous. And what you're seeing here is, uh, you know, it opens for harvest. So then the uh, harvest season starts April 24th through May 7th. One 
one fish per calendar year per person. Uh, the slot is 45 to 50, so that's the slot you can keep. So if you catch one 45 to 50, you can keep one. You also have to purchase a tag for that, which is $5. So make sure if you plan on keeping one that you buy a tag. You don't need a tag if you're only catch and release fishing. So don't, there's no need for a tag if you're not gonna keep one. Uh, and then you can also keep one over 75 inches. So that's April 24th through May 7th. And then starting May 8th, it goes back to catch and release May 8th through May 15th. And then uh, May 16th through June 30th, it's completely closed. You cannot fish for sturgeon at all from May 16th to June 30th. So once again, season's open now. Basically for catch and release fishing, it's open now through May 15th. Another thing about timing uh, when you want to go up there, another thing to keep in mind is if you, if you don't want to do any sort of walleye fishing, um, my recommendation would be to wait for the walleye season to end. So the walleye, the prior year's walleye season, you know, ice fishing season continues through April 14th, I believe. So uh, when that river opens up, all the walleye fishermen, you know, pile on there to, to to catch the walleyes coming in out of the lake, you know, pre-spawn fish, and it's very popular. I've heard of guys waiting, you know, a couple hours to get their boat launched on, on prime weekends. So uh, if you don't want to deal with walleyes or don't want to fish with walleyes, my recommendation would be to wait for that season to end and then you don't have to deal with any of that. Like I said, you, there's a lot of boats, a lot of people, and a lot of the guys are, are drifting and trolling. And if you're anchored fish, you're, you're kind of in the way. Um, not that it's anyone's body of water, but... Uh, with the two types of fishing, they don't mix real well. So uh, having said that, you can catch some nice sturgeon as soon as the river opens. So if you do want to try it for some walleyes, then get up there as soon as you can. If the water, if the ice opens up, you can launch your boat. The water is fairly clear. Um, you can have some really good days of walleye fishing as well as sturgeon fishing. So essentially you have 80 miles of river to get away from people if you want to. You can fish with the crowds or you can go find your own spot and that's what makes it nice. These, these fish are coming out of the lake, moving into the river to spawn, and there's no specific spots you need to target. Um, I have had luck, better luck at some spots, but we've also pulled up to random spots and caught fish. So um, don't feel like you have to be an expert on fishing holes and current bends and uh, current breaks. It's really not necessary because you can catch them throughout the whole river. The U.S. side of the river. <laughs> Don't fish Canada. I'll ask about boats. Uh, I've seen boats, I've seen 12, I'll go as far as saying I've seen kayaks out there. Hey Jake. <laughs> uh, I've seen kayaks, 14 foot boats, 16 foot boats, all the way up to 24 foot boats, pontoon boats. There's no restrictions of what you can or can't not take out on the river. Um, don't be afraid of taking whatever you have to use. Um, there's really no restrictions. Um, there are some areas where the river does get shallow and you have to pay attention to not only your depth finder, but also hopefully you have some kind of contour mapping on your sonar or a uh, uh, Navionics app such as this. Um, but for the most part, you should be good to go. Um, there's no real navigational buoy markers up there. Uh, so if you stay in the middle of the, the river, that's usually your best bet. Um, now, if you do plan on going out into Four Mile Bay or out there to the Gap, uh, you're going to have to pay close attention to the uh, wind forecast uh, because it gets whipping and it can get kind of dangerous out there if you're out there in a small boat. So if you plan to go across Four Mile Bay, keep that in mind. If that wind starts picking up 20 to 25 miles an hour and you're out in a 14-foot boat, you might be in trouble. So that's another thing to keep in mind. Talk about baits and gear next. Um, I'll just show you quickly what I have here for gear. Uh, what I've used, what I've been using, kind of mostly for my guide service, are these spinning rods. Here is, a, is an Okuma Record Chaser, seven and a half foot medium heavy rod, uh, paired with an Okuma Coronado. See, the size is CDX 65. It's a big reel. It's a beefy reel. Um, you got to remember that there's, you know. 100 to 150 pound fish out there. So I would much rather be oversized than undersized. That's the one key point to take away from this is don't be undersized. Sure, you can catch those fish if you're undersized, but it's gonna take a lot longer. It's gonna stress those fish out. Just be oversized. There's nothing wrong with ever being oversized. So in this case, I have this CDX 65 and um, 
it's like I said, it's a big reel. You could probably go on this particular model. You could go down to the uh, the 55 and 50 and get away with it probably. As far as spinning reels go, I recommend you know anything 55 and over is probably ideal. Uh, 40 would be the minimum. I think 40 is probably a little bit too small even uh, for any of the spinning reels. 40 or 4,000, I would go above that. For line, I'm using a suffix 832, um, 80 pound. Again, I wouldn't go anything less than 80 pound. There's no reason to. Um, they're not line shy. So, and if you can go with like a 50 pound braid and the, the tensile strength is gonna be fine. Where you're gonna run into trouble is if you nick it on some rocks or anything, that smaller braid is just gonna snap instantly. So what's good about going to a heavier braid is you get a little more abrasion resistant. And you can go with mono. I know guys that use mono. There's nothing wrong with mono. I just prefer braid and that's what I go with and that's what I would recommend. So, um, and what I have here is a, a circle hook. This particular circle hook is an eight aught, and some people might say that is a little big. Gotta get that closer to you so you can take a look at that. Um, this particular one is a VMC, I believe. And again, like I say, some people think this eight hot might be a little bit too big. What I like about it is I can jam a lot of bait on there. I can put two, three crawlers on there. I can put a couple fat heads, you know, a piece of sucker, whatever. Uh, it just gives me the option to put more bait on there. Um, I'm not afraid of using too much bait. Um, in fact, in this system, you run into a lot of uh, red horse and suckers and even walleyes. They'll come through and they'll pick your bait clean and you might not notice it. So if you have more bait on there, there's a good chance you might be left with a little bait on there if you're not checking your bait off. And uh, I have a leader tied on. This is a little long. I actually have this set up for my uh, fall season on the St. Croix, but you know, this is probably 20 inches long. You know, I prefer up on the rainy to use probably 12 to 15 inches is probably ideal. A lot of that depends on the current. The faster the current, the shorter your leader length you want. So if the current's super fast, you know, you might go down to eight inches. And if you ha don't have much current, you can go, you know, bump it back up to here to like 20 inches. Uh, I have a, a three ounce weight with a sinker slide tied onto this one here. And again, that will vary. Basically, you want to go the smallest weight possible to keep it on the bottom. Uh, if you feel like the, if it's getting pulled off the bottom, just go heavier until it's, you know, sitting on the bottom. I've had, like I said, I've had trips up there where we're using 10, 12 ounces of weight. I've also had trips up there where we're using one ounce of weight. So that's why I like these sinker slides. You can change on the fly. You don't have to retie. You know, you just undo the clip and put a different size on because it can even vary from spot to spot, that current up there. So um, again, the sinker I use, this is called a flat bank sinker. And I know a lot of people, I'm not going to get too deep into this, but a lot of a lot of the videos and uh, posts and things you see, a lot of people use no rolls and there's nothing wrong with using no rolls. I just don't prefer them. Uh, what happens is the no roll, first of all, you have to retie every time you want to change, um, which makes a hanging sinker like a bank or a flat bank uh, better for that. But also with your no roll riding on your line, it tends to act like a sail as the current gets up underneath it and it kind of lifts up. And I've had situations where I can have my bait pinned with a three ounce flat bank and I had a, a five ounce no roll and it wouldn't sit on the bottom. So you can get away with a lot smaller sinker, which is better, I think too. And finally, the last reason is I see a lot of these no rolls, people will put their rod up in a, in a uh, rod holder and as they're running across the river, that no roll is spinning, just spinning super fast and that'll actually cut your line. You don't realize it, but it'll cut through your line. And I've seen, I've seen sinkers go flying as the line snaps as you're going across the water. So that's why I don't like no rolls. I know a lot of people use them and promote them. I just, I think they're overrated to be honest with you. Uh, then real quickly here, I'll show you, you know, a bait caster setup. This is in a, what is this? This is a Shimano Takoda. This one's a little beat up. I'm not super, uh, careful with my gear. This one's been used and abused quite a bit, but uh, this rod is a custom rod, so I won't even really talk too much about that one. I have, uh, had some guys custom build that one for me as a gift actually, which was a really nice, but um, this is a Takota 600. I've had no issues with that reel. If you're into bait casters, you know, I would, I would stick with a, uh, you know, a 6500 series and up, 
you know, 7,000, you can get away with a 5,500, but I think that's too small. Even some, some cases, a 6,500, like an Abu 6,500 is kind of on the low end with the drag and everything, but it'll work, it'll, it'll work fine. You don't have to get super expensive, uh, especially with the rods. If you're gonna spend money, spend money on the reels and the drag system, I think you'll be happy. Um, you can get away with, uh, you know, medium, heavy, ugly stick if you need to. Lots of options out there for cheap rods. So for bait, I just I want to go through some bait options here as well. Um, night crawlers are going to be probably the number one source of bait. Everyone using night crawlers. Uh, Sturgeon really like night crawlers. They're easy to get. Um, and that's probably a favorite amongst the uh, community of anglers. Um, over the years, I've kind of switched over to using almost more minnows or a combination of crawlers and minnows. Uh, it seems like I kind of like the fish tell us what we're doing. We put, we put some crawlers on, we put some minnows on, um, a combo of both, maybe a different type of minnow, shiners, uh, fatheads, suckers. Um, if the fish have a preference, they're going to tell you. So make sure, especially if you have several people in the boat, put out several baits because we have had instances where guess what, all they're biting is fatheads. That's the only thing we can catch them on is fatheads. So, um, you know, we've had days where we went through several scoops of fatheads and hardly used any crawlers. So um, keep your options open for sure. And again, like I said, just ball it on there. There's no right or wrong way to hook it on there. Just get a nice ball of bait and throw it out there. So for techniques, just want to kind of go through some techniques here. Um, it's pretty simple. You know, find a spot you want to fish, throw anchor, make sure you're anchored tight, make sure you're not swinging. Um, you don't want your bait moving around on the bottom. You want your bait pinned to the bottom so those sturgeon can find it. They'll sniff it out and find it. If it keeps moving, they might give up and move on or just, you know, get tired of trying to find it or maybe they won't find it. So uh, what we do is, you know, throw out, let it sit on the bottom. For these reels, what you might be tempted to do is this reel has a bait clicker. What that means is this is a uh, spool release and then you can adjust the tension back here, the drag for fishing live bait. And I use this a lot for fishing for flatheads. Uh, it allows the fish to pick up the bait and run. And like I said, you can adjust the tension of that. Like I said, it, it might be tempting to do this for sturgeon fishing, but don't do that because sturgeon, every once in a while, they'll pick up your bait and run with it. For the most part, they won't. They come up to the bait, they suck it in, and they just kind of sit there. Sometimes they'll spit it out, suck it back in. So do not use a bait clicker, bait feeder, any of that stuff. Keep a tight line. And what happens when that sturgeon picks up that line, you know, you're just going to see small bumps, small taps on your rod. And they're kind of low and slow and consistent. When that happens, basically just Either start reeling, don't reel super fast, just you know, give it a good tension, or pick up your rod and just sweep it. With these circle hooks, they'll get hooked pretty much instantly. Um, when you start seeing some of these sharper taps like that, that's a lot of times that's a sucker or walleye. And uh, you, once you start doing this for a while, you'll be able to tell the difference right away. Um, so you either just let it sit there and let them you know, move on, or just reel it away from them or, or bring it in and recast. Uh, if you're getting, you know, harassed by a lot of suckers. Another thing we do is when we're fishing at night is we'll, uh, we'll attach a set of bells to there. So when that fish is biting, you know, we'll be alerted by the bells. They're a little annoying overall, but they do help uh, detect bites after dark for sure. So I would consider doing that if you're fishing after dark. Speaking of uh, dark, that's another big question I get asked all the time is, should I fish during the day or, you know, at, after dark, which is better? You know, people see a lot of my videos, they see us fishing after dark. And honestly, I don't think there is a preference or a better time to be out there. The best time to be out there is when you can be out there. If you can fish all 24 hours, fish all 24 hours. Time on the water is gonna trump, you know, when you can get out there. So whatever works convenient for you, get out there. If you have a choice. Now, so here's why we choose to fish evening and after dark. Uh, there's a, a couple of reasons. One, there's less people on the water. Less people on the water, less pressure, less boat waves. You know, everything seems to just quiet down and, and our fishing seems to 
get a little better. I don't know if the numbers show that, but it's definitely more relaxing to be out there that time. Uh, two, the wind dies, normally dies, you know, after dark. And uh, wind can be a big factor when you're trying to detect those bites. If your boat is bouncing all over and you can't, you know, see your rod tip getting hit, you're going to miss some bites. And in fact, if it gets really windy, you're going to want to take your rod and just hold it and feel for those bites because um, you just won't see it if it's really windy or if you're getting a lot of boat traffic and waves. So that's another reason I prefer after dark is just because less wind. So another thing I want to talk about is, so now you've finally caught a sturgeon and you're bringing it in, now what? Uh, I would recommend a large net. Um, that's To me, that's the easiest way. I know guys have um, kind of loops that they grab the tail with or they'll just reach down with their hand and grab the tail. And uh, that works good too, but I just prefer a large, you know, musky size net or a big, you know, flathead catfish type net. Just one with a big hoop, a large bag. What's nice about that is you can get that fish in the net and then you can concentrate on clearing stuff away in the boat, um, getting cameras ready, whatever. That fish is left in the, in the water, you know, as you're prepping all the stuff, getting tape measures, whatever. Um, so you can focus on making sure that fish gets into the boat safely. You get a nice picture and get it released. So that's why I prefer a net. Uh, sometimes, you know, you have to like, one thing you want to make sure you don't do is if you get that fish in the net, don't lever it over the side because those most nets you buy are just going to fold in half, especially with a, you know, 80 to 100 pound fish. So once you get that fish in the net, turn the handle vertical and then grab the hoop and pull it over the side. Um, you're going to get a lot more strength that way of the, using the hoop versus the handle and that leverage, you're not, you know, using that leverage to break the handle. So, um, just another little tip. I'll show you here. There's some, uh, there's some tips for handling the sturgeon that the, the Minnesota DNR came out with. And, uh, another big thing you want to make sure you do is not grabbing them by the gills and holding them up by the gills. Make sure you support the fish horizontally. You know, under the belly, if you can, just hold it like a big, you know, log if you can. And uh, what I prefer is grabbing it by the tail and then running my hand underneath the belly up to the peck fin and then lifting it like that. And that's easier said than done on some of these, you know, 80 to 100 pound fish. You might need some help with a second person holding it up there uh, because it gets tough, especially if you're down on your knees trying to get up. Um, or sitting down, another good one is sitting down, have someone put it on your lap and just hold it like that. Um, ideally, that's probably the best. Well, actually the best is not even bringing it in the boat at all. If it's too big to even bring it out in, um, just unhook it over the side of the boat and try to get a picture of it in the water. In fact, I think the, the DNR even recommends, you know, with the big fish, not even to bring them in the boat. So keep that in mind as well. All right. Well, I'm sure I forgot something. Uh, I went over quite a bit here. I hope this helps you if you've never been up there and you want to get up there and you kind of want to do a self-guided trip. I hope that helps you. Typically on good days, you know, we're catching five to 10 fish a day. We have had, you know, several days we've had 20 fish and we have had days where we haven't caught anything. So, um, kind of keep low expectations yet expect great things because there's some really big fish out there and they're a lot of fun to catch. And, uh, Actually, while I'm out of here, maybe I'll show you. Uh, I caught a, I caught a big one here uh, last February, and I had a. Rather than get a, a mount made, I had this uh, life-size print made from the print shop. I got some little notes on it there. 78 inch, 29 and a half inch girth, 120 pounds signed and that's the uh that's the minnesota state record i think that's about all i really wanted to go over um there's a there's a lot more in-depth detail stuff that i might be able to touch on but uh, this i just kind of wanted to go over the basics um what i'll do is in the description of this video, I'll put a link to some of this gear that I use. I'll also put a link to my playlist on my YouTube channel that uh, I have 13 years of archives of my Rainy River sturgeon trips that you can go back and look and maybe kind of watch and get some tips and see maybe some areas we're fishing, uh, what we're using for bait, so on and so forth. So that just uh, might something might be something for you to watch and. Uh, 
and get some tips from. All right, well, thanks for watching. I hope this helped out a little bit. Uh, hopefully I get up there this year. I'm, I'm gonna try to get up there uh, sometime in uh, probably late April, I'm hoping for. Um, if any of you watching this are interested in, in uh, catfishing or sturgeon in the metro area here, I, like I said, I run a guide service on the uh, Minnesota, Mississippi, and St. Croix River for catfish and sturgeon, and you can look me up on uh, threeriversfishingadventures.com and uh, shoot me a message and we'll get something set up. Thanks again.